shifting mindsets and habits for better business. I'm very excited to do this because the world as we know it is in a royal mess. Um, if it wasn't clear before COVID, it's now become abundantly clear. We face uh, myriads of challenges. Humanity can and absolutely has to be better. Businesses, I believe, have a critical role to play in changing the culture of society and therefore creating the kind of world we want and deserve. This change in culture, which we'll talk about today, will not only benefit businesses themselves by making them more productive, but will contribute to creating a world in which every individual can fulfill his or her potential by um, building on and utilizing their unique abilities and strengths in service to humanity and by adding value to society. The reason businesses play such an important role is because the habits that are formed in business and workplace settings are carried from that setting to international life. In fact, the story starts even earlier. It starts at home, right? The habits we have at home, for instance, how we treat each other, how men and women relate to each other, carry over into the workplace and carry over into global society. The alchemy of peace is a method that allows us to achieve the change that we're looking for. So creating a more peaceful world in which we can actualize our potential more quickly and effectively. It essentially posits that in order for change to happen, um, we need to identify and let go of old mindsets and habits and replace them with new ones. So that is the, the, the meta belief here. It essentially involves a number of steps that you'll see on this slide. The first step is to bring to light, to the light of consciousness, old mindsets that are essentially running in the background of our minds. They're like the operating system of the computer that we don't even realize is there, but which is uh, it, it driving a lot of things that are happening as we utilize the computer. The mindset, of course, being the lens through which we view, understand, and interpret our circumstances and events, and uh, therefore through which we understand our reality. It makes up our pattern of thoughts. Unfortunately, this lens often gets distorted by limiting beliefs, false assumptions, and disempowering interpretations. So the first step is to bring all of these to the fore and see what they are. The second is to understand the dysfunctional habits that flow from the old mindsets and how these dysfunctional habits are disturbing us. The third is mindfully choosing to replace the old mindset with a new, more empowering mindset. And the fourth is to then choose a new habit that seamlessly flows from the new mindset. Really, the principle at work here is the principle that small tweaks can lead to massive changes in results. It's sort of like flying an airplane. If you change the trajectory of the flight by even one to two degrees, your destination is going to be vastly different from the one you had originally plotted out. Now, the first step in moving towards this new world, the new first step that businesses in particular can take and that we can start working on in the workplaces is to identify and to define a new concept of leadership. My personal favorite um, definition of leadership is this one by Jim Rohn, who is an American entrepreneur and motivational speaker. He says, to lead others is to help them change their thoughts, beliefs, and actions for the better. When I ponder and reflect on this definition, a few other things come to mind. The first is, that we understand that each and every one of us is a leader, regardless of our position within a business. If we are in a position to influence another human being, we are by definition a leader. We're not just a manager hitting metrics, we are a person of influence and a leader. The second thing that occurs to me is that uh, leadership begins with ourselves, the ability to self-direct and self regulate is the beginning of leadership. And we can all start working on that. 
The third idea that flows from this is that our role as leaders is to motivate and inspire others to take positive action and in the context of the business to also achieve success. As we do this, we also understand that we're as concerned about helping people grow and actualize their individual potential as we are about hitting goals and metrics. In short, our focus must be a growth orientation as opposed to an outcome orientation. And when I uh, work myself, I, I do some coaching and I, when I work with small businesses, I find that when they make this mental shift from a, an outcome orientation where they get so stressed and they're, they become very myopic in, in what they're doing and how they're doing it. But when they're inspired to help the members of their business grow individually and, and collectively, all of a sudden the dynamics completely shift. So the first thing is to redefine leadership. The second thing we need to do, the second step, is to reconceptualize the role of power and authority. In other words, what we conceive the role of power and authority are, is. Our old conception is basically informed by the following beliefs. These are some of these old beliefs that are outgrown. The first is that those in power seek to basically dominate and control. As soon as you have this mindset, I mean, you can, you can just feel it in your body. If you're at work and you think that the person who is in power or your team manager or team leader or your manager or the owner of the business is really about dominance and control, you immediately, you become defiant, you become resistant, you, you, you seize up, you, uh, you tend to want to disobey and to, to, to demonstrate that you understand as well as they do. And it just, it lowers morale in the workplace and it just makes for a very um, stressful environment, as I say, where the choices that are available are, are not seen clearly and where innovation and creativity are stifled. The second belief that we tend to have about power and authority is that those who have these two powers are driven by ego and self-interest. And the third is, and this is also a very destructive one, the belief that those in authority somehow have a higher station than we do, that they're better than us, that they're superior, that they have a higher status. Now, what would happen if we were to flip this mindset and replace it with a new one, a new empowering way of conceiving of power and authority? And I have suggested a few ways in which we might do this. The first is to truly recognize that power and authority are necessary elements for organizing society. Their role is as simple as creating the necessary conditions in which we as individual and as groups, small and large, all the way up to the global society, but definitely as organizations, can develop and, and actualize our potential. The second responsibility that people in power and authority have is to create a unity of vision, unity of thought that then allows us to act together and have unity of action. As another famous American entrepreneur, Ken Blanchard said, the greatest leaders mobilize others by coalescing people around a shared vision. Third component of this new conception of power and authority is that we learn to associate different words with these two um, concepts. Now, this comes from a letter written by the governing body of the Baha'i community in 2013, in which they say we learn to associate power and authority with the words such as release, encourage, channel, guide, and enable. And then they go on to say something else. They say power is not a finite entity, which is to be seized and jealously guarded. And yet how often do we actually see this in the workplace, right? Turf wars, a sense of control, especially when it comes to information. Uh, information is power, um, cutting people out of major projects, not letting people see the totality of the project so that they don't take it over. Um, Instead, uh, it, it, this governing body says that 
power constitutes a limitless capacity to transform, a limitless capacity to transform that resides in the human race as a body. All right, the next component in the new conception is that um, leaders are there because they have the duty and indeed the privilege of serving. When I think of this component, I think of a waterfall. You know how there's all this sound and fury when you're higher up at the waterfall, you see all this powerful water crashing down. Well, the truth is that real power in the waterfall resides right at the bottom where it's quieter and where the pool of water gathers. This is another image actually that's given to us um, in, in the, in, in, in the Baha'i writings as an image of what true servitude looks like, where the reservoir, we should aim to be that reservoir at the bottom of the waterfall that gathers the life-giving waters. And so that spirit of servitude and being in service is critical. And again, we need to change our conception of what authority and power mean. The next one is a really important one. The next component has to do with understanding that those in power are merely fulfilling a function to which they are best suited during a certain period of time. This is really important. In other words, it's not because they're just naturally superior human beings or should be accorded a higher status so that we should kowtow to them, no. They're just literally that particular cog in the wheel that is suited to do that job for that period of time. If we adopt this notion, then all of a sudden, first of all, we have a lot more sense of self-esteem. We, we value our own contribution to the business a lot more. And we frankly value the contribution of others whom we may not uh, value otherwise, including the person in the mailroom or the person who is cleaning the offices or everybody basically up the chain, so to speak, has contributes value. And, and COVID has been an amazing opportunity for us to really learn this lesson, to value the contributions of people in society generally whom we don't value, like who deliver things or farmers or uh, you know, healthcare workers or people who clean hospitals or, or, or offices. The next essential component that we should look for in power and authority is that we want uh, leaders who are able to see the long view and be proactive. In other words, they need to be able to address problems before they become emergencies so that we're not just in reactive mode, reacting to the crisis of the day. Again, COVID has provided us with a beautiful opportunity to really learn this lesson. And finally, the last component of, power, of, of understanding reconceptualizing power and authority is to understand that we're looking for folks in leadership positions who are able, as Rosalind Carter famously said, to take people where they don't necessarily want to go, but ought to be, right? So one of the abject failures of leadership today uh, on all fronts, whether in business or in global society, is this failure to bring people along, to create a vision and then inspire people to move towards that vision. It's really tied into that creating unity of thought and vision, which we also talked about. Now, once we have redefined uh, leadership in the way we discussed and we have reconceptualized the ideas of um, power and, of, and authority, we then naturally get to the point where we start to look for very different kinds of leaders to the ones we have looked for to date, right? Once you change the conception of what their role is, um, then, then you're starting to look for different things. In particular, we start to demand certain qualities of character. These include, and again, I've drawn these actually from a beautiful work by one of the central figures in the, in the Baha'i faith, um, uh, who, whose name is Abdul Baha, and he has articulated this in a, a lovely book uh, that you might be interested in picking up. It's called The Secret of Divine Civilization. He says the qualities that we should be looking for include honesty. And again, we see this, but honesty also in the workplace. 
honesty and truthfulness about what's going on. And it really relates to transparency, but I'll come to transparency in a little later, a little later. So honesty about how the business is doing, about what we are, about what the fears are, what the opportunities are, what the various forces of action are, uh, about the potential consequences if we take or don't take particular uh, lines of action. The second is freedom from prejudice. You don't want to be in an environment where the culture at the top is discriminatory, whether it's discrimination against ethnic minorities, racial minorities, uh, women, uh, people of, uh, you know, who are transgender. It really doesn't matter what the story is. Prejudice is prejudice. And so you want um, certain, to have certain qualities of character. Courage is another. Courage to do the right thing, even if it's not popular. That is a key one. Um, we see this at the global governance level, but we definitely also see this in business. Freedom from corruption, that's key. You can sink a business if the people in leadership positions are cheating or embezzling or corrupt in other ways. Basic competence. I know this sounds uh, almost facile and obvious, but it's amazing how not obvious it is. You know, when you promote people because they're your friends or because, because you scratch my back, I scratch yours, and you're not actually looking at basic competence, it again really destroys morale in the, um, in the workplace. I'm reminded actually of a personal experience I had. I worked in private practice as a lawyer for about 18 years, and, and I worked uh, also in government at the Department of State. And during the five years I was there, one of the very bizarre things that happened in my particular office was that our boss had us write our own um, uh, re reviews at the end of each year. It was the strangest thing. And if we didn't have enough superlatives in those reviews, he would send them back. He didn't want to waste his time writing reviews and he wanted to look good in the eyes of his bosses. And so we had to write them, which put us in a very awkward position. We didn't learn anything because we didn't get any feedback on you know, where we needed to improve and how we could improve. And at the same time, we were constantly asked to rewrite these to make them even more self-glorifying. It was a real had a real dampening effect and it did not help in terms of promoting people who actually have the competence to do jobs and to identify them and give them so that has always stuck with me. The next uh, quality we look for is the willingness to listen in a spirit of humility. It's a very uh, rare quality and coupled with another very important quality, compassion and empathy. Now, these are as important in business as in global governance. And we've seen with COVID again, how the, these qualities of the ability to listen and compassion are starting to be valued uh, particularly in places like New Zealand with Jacinda Ardern, who is known as a leader who has these qualities in spades and how appreciated it has been by all the people in, in New Zealand. Um, the second habit, this is gonna be short, I'm almost done, is to seek diversity in decision-making. It's uh, only by willingness to look at things from one another's perspective that our collective understanding within a business or within any organization is enhanced. And therefore, the range of possibilities open to us is broadened. Indeed, experience and research have both shown that more diverse and, inclu and inclusive decision making lead to better outcomes in business. They lead to faster decision making. They lead to better business performance and they lead to financial gain. What's not to like, right? Um, so ensuring that people in decision-making positions reflect a diverse range of values, interests, perspectives, and experiences dilutes the inevitable inherent biases that, uh, of, of certain individuals and creates a more fertile ground for innovative solutions. So diversity should be affirmatively sought and welcomed and regarded as a source of strength and resilience. It, it's an analogy I like to use is that of, of looking at a gem. Uh, if different people look at it from different angles, depending on how the light hits the gem, we may see different colors. You might see red, someone else blue, I might see yellow. If we start arguing with each 
further about who's right, we, we're all wrong, you know, or we, we've all basically undermined ourselves. But if we're willing to, to, to step into the other's shoes and see things from a different point of view, our collective understanding is enhanced. The final habit is cultivating a culture of transparency. One of the things that plagues our workplaces, our businesses, is this business of hoarding information and not sharing it openly and not soliciting it openly. By doing this, we really, again, um, shoot ourselves in the foot. We, we make decisions ignorant of dangers we face, the scope of opportunities open to us, alternative courses of action, and the likely consequences of our decisions. So this was the group of ideas that I wanted to share with you. If you like these ideas, there's more of this in the Alchemy of Peace, uh, Six Essential Shifts in Mindsets and Habits to Achieve World Peace. It's available on Amazon in digital and paperback versions. Okay, Savaida, thank you so much for, for the talk. Uh, I haven't read the book yet, but uh, I can see there is much gems inside and this concept of alchemy sounds very interesting. Uh, what I think I love the most about your talk was when you talked about the, the importance of not focusing on outcome too much and being there to serve the people uh, and inspiring to help them and grow. And I think this is really one of the key learnings I, I have and I'm still having every day in my, in my work, uh, which is connected with the privilege of serving and, you know, this idea of creating unity and in terms of this, I have two questions. The first question is in terms of this, when you, when you talk about power of authority in the old paradigm, uh, you talked about control as, a, of course, uh, something that has to go in a sense. Uh, and, but then you talked about the function, right, of, uh, uh, of serving. And uh, I was just a bit confused there on how, you know, if you have the function to guide, facilitate, enable, then you're facilitating, you have some degree of control over the mic or control over uh, who speaks and the environment, and you need that for unity to a certain degree, or maybe not, I don't know. I, I wanted to have your thoughts on this. Uh, and, and then the second question is more, uh, when you talked about leadership as uh, helping influencing thoughts and beliefs and actions in the better way, I, I, I couldn't agree more that, you know, influencing yourself first, you know, how you feel and what you think about will influence your actions and your results and your beliefs and your whole life and then doing it to other people and then to organizations. And this is really the different degrees of leadership from one to, to many and, and, and getting to a, a big level. I was just a bit curious about the better element because uh, I talked about this in a few talks and people were challenging me, but better is a very subjective concept. Better for you, I mean, what's better for you might not be fulfilling the other person. And if it's, you know, sometimes it's a challenge. And just the last comment, uh, when you mentioned about long-term view, you know, and leaders having this proactive and long-term view, I couldn't agree more that it's critical, but I really struggled to, to see, um, I'm positive in most things, but I'm not so positive in this one because, you know, with COVID and right now people are like looking at tomorrow and, and survival and companies and are all designed for the next quarter survival. And then how can you, uh, how can you have this long-term view? I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a, just a challenge, a personal <laughs> challenge. So you've raised three points. I will try to very uh, quickly address them, hopefully to your satisfaction. So um, I think that with your first point, the ultimate question you had, what, what is the difference? You know, how is facilitating uh, different from control because facilitating by definition involves a certain element of control? Well, here is where this idea of outcome orientation versus growth orientation actually, uh, this is where the rubber meets the road. When you facilitate a group of people um, with the, it, with detachment from where you're going to end up, you're facilitating. If you have a very definite view of exactly where you want to end up, you're so attached to the outcome that you're constant, as you're facilitating, you're constantly trying to push people to go in the direction of that outcome. Again, what I've found in working with businesses is once they let go of that very, so it's good to, goals are obviously important, but uh, being attached to particular outcomes can really get in the way because what you're doing is 
you're missing the opportunity as you go through your facilitations and your consultations to come up with ideas that you couldn't have conceived of when you started off with the journey. And being detached from a fixed final outcome allows you the opportunity to see an amazing uh, you know, a new idea and say, yes, this is it. We can turn on a dime. And you bring other people along because first of all, you're encouraging them to continually express themselves and share their innovative ideas as opposed to say, oh no, well, this isn't gonna mesh with what the boss had in mind about the outcome they want to achieve. And they find that inspiring because they're growing and they're able to use their unique abilities and strengths in contribution. And when we're facile about letting go of things, you can take in a lot of new ideas and just sift through them and say, no, 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 no. Oh, that's an amazing one. No, now we can change our outcome. And this is something that I think the Baha'i community has been doing really well with this three-step process of consult, act, reflect. This is where the reflection comes in. You, you look at what has worked well. So you started off with a goal and with an outcome in mind, but you're not, not attached to it. You're able to step back in a detached fashion and say, what worked well, we'll continue more of the same. What didn't work well, maybe we just chuck it completely or maybe we just tweak it. So that's the first thing. The second question you asked about was better, changing beliefs, habits, and thoughts for the better. So. I, the excellent question, and I think, again, bearing in mind, it is within the context of the de first definition, uh, the first reconceptualization of power and authority, which is to create the conditions in which each member of society or organization and business and the collective can actualize their potential. If that is your goal, it becomes very clear what is better and what's worse. If you're living in an environment where individuals are not able to actualize their potential and the group is not able to actualize its potential, that is not better. <laughs> um, so I don't think we need to get too wrapped around the axle about what is good and bad and evil. And We're not getting into really philosophical ideas so much. It's, I think it's a lot simpler and, and much easier to diagnose and detect um, than we make it out to be. And frankly, if morale, for instance, is really low in an organization, that tells you something. That is a, that is a warning sign that people are not feeling that, that potential is being actualized. They're feeling stifled. So, so there's some indicators that actually tell us whether we're moving generally in an upward direction or whether we're retrogressing. Um, and the last one was proactivity. You, you, I, I hear you, totally understandable, that given everything we see with COVID, you don't feel very optimistic, it sounds like to me, about our ability to become more proactive. Um, I view it a little bit differently. I view what we're seeing with COVID and climate change. I think COVID has been a crash course for us to change tracks and to learn some things so that we can avert absolute disaster with climate change. We're already on the disaster track. But um, the opportunity is to learn what happens when we don't think proactively, when we let things turn into an emergency, as we did with COVID, even though the WHO started warning us in the early 2000s that this pandem pandemic was coming, that it was gonna go from animals to humans, that it was gonna be airborne. We knew all of these things. This is nothing new. <laughs> and yet leaders fail to act, right? But I think this is actually one of the key um, qualities that we need to start honing. The idea that the, the honing the ability to act and think proactively as opposed to short term, based on expediency, based on short term interests. You know, when you're talking about meeting the quarter's goals and so on. Yes. But while that's important, it has to be viewed in a larger context. We need to start demanding that our leaders have longer term vision and start training for it. And we need to be able to demonstrate that having that kind of vision actually benefits business in the long run. So I hope that these thoughts have been helpful, but thank you very much, Alexandre. Um, if I wanted to start tomorrow in this new way of uh, uh, control, new way of management, what would be uh, a 
valuable first step I could do tomorrow going okay. in this direction? What could you do tomorrow? Well, what do you think you could do tomorrow from the, <laughs> I'm gonna, so <sighs> what, what in, in anything I said resonated with you and you thought, aha, did you have kind of, because I, I'm curious to know, I'm, I'm not, you guys are probably more expert in business than I am. I mm -hmm. have managed groups of people. I had my own law firm for a while and I manage groups at the state department and I coach, but, but what, was there any one idea that you thought, ah, this is something I can use tomorrow? I, when, when I look in my, 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 uh, my uh, notes, uh, I would, uh, what comes to my mind is uh, the serving people is, is something I, I could go in and say, okay, tomorrow I will serve my people. I will probably bring them some sweets or I don't know what, 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 what I do to serve them, to start serving them. Or, or maybe it's just the, the mood in, in, in I, I go into the office and say, okay, hey, today, guys, I'm, I'm serving you. Okay, that's a wonderful start. So, I, so as you're talking, I'm, I'm, three things just leapt to mind for me, which I will, I will share with you and see if they're of, of any use. One of the things I would do um, if I were thinking of making a shift is figuring out a way to truly identify the unique abilities of each member of my group. So maybe gathering, and because consultation is such an important component and, and, and it also incorporates that spirit of transparency, I would literally gather my people together and say, look, I, I don't know, I attended a talk or I've been reflecting and I, or I've been in conversation with a group of friends and I've had, a, 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 you know, I had an aha moment. I had a shift and I'm excited about doing things a little differently. I think we could all benefit. What do you think? So ask them questions and then ask them, what are things that you feel are your, to each of you, your unique ability and strength that you feel that you could contribute to this business that you feel you haven't been able to so far? And so just get to know them and get to know their aspirations and desires better. Once you know what those are, then as you do your, your planning, again, in consultation with them, ideally, you can start to weave that in and it's going to make them feel so much more vested in the business. The other is to think about, the other thing I would do is I would sit back and, and look at your decision makers and see, do you have the diversity that would make you more powerful? How many women are, do you have? How many uh, uh, ethnic minorities or people of racial backgrounds or people with different experiences do you have on your decision-making teams? That would be the second place I would look. And the third would be just to incorporate consultation into all aspects and just be very open that you are, you are wanting to make a change in the culture of your organization. Just telling people that in and of itself creates an amazing shift. So that's, those are three things I'd suggest. Something that's worth exploring because it, that to me, you know, we all have a set of beliefs that, as I said, operate in the background of our minds. And it starts with us as individuals. And listening to what you said, it strikes me that you have a personal rule or belief that was exactly what you articulated, that the very fact of offering an idea or suggestion is me saying, oh, I'm better than you. And what, and, and you know, imagine if everybody did that in this world, how deprived would we all be? What would be the incredible cost that we would bear the cost of deprivation? Thank God when scientists have good ideas or people in, in whatever sphere have good ideas, they come out and they share it with us because we all benefit. So what if you were to flip this rule, replace this, literally you're doing this replace mindset. So, so the alchemy of peace is really a methodology, right? You identify the old driving belief that isn't serving and you replace it with a new one. What if you were to replace this idea with a different notion that said, oh my gosh, I've been given this, this amazing gift. Each of us is put on this planet 
with an ability to think and reflect for ourselves. And we actually have a responsibility to others to share our ideas and suggestions. And by pooling all of them, we contribute to making the world a better place. Now, all of a sudden, the story has changed and you feel empowered and free to, to share. The other thing is that your act of sharing leaves people completely free to take it or not take it. If you're truly detached from the outcome and, you, and you're not attached to them taking your idea, you should be able to liberally make suggestions. And maybe you make 10 good suggestions and one sticks. That's wonderful. Or none stick, that's okay. But at least you'll know you tried. You know, it's interesting, if, if, if I hear about a good restaurant to eat, I have no qualms about going and telling all my friends, oh my God, there's this restaurant, you all have to go, right? We all don't think, well, if I say something, I'm gonna sound superior and I, no. But as soon as we have ideas or ways of thinking, somehow we get, mm, uh, we get more hesitant. And it really just has to do with what we're telling ourselves in our head about what this means about me. And what are people gonna think about me? That's another thing that's driving one here. Does it matter? So I would say share liberally. And when you share it from a place of humility, you can't go wrong. Wonderful presentation. Uh, I did my dissertation in 2016 on leadership and power. And I just love where you've gone with this. And I love the references. I can't wait to read your book and learn more about what you had to say. So the question I wanted to ask you, and I, and this, this, this parallels the same question that I raise around the, um, uh, the institute process, uh, that you know, the foundation of capacity building is to create the environment and, and support the growth and development of people achieving their full potential and uh, contributing to society in, in service. Um, and there's a polarity I hear, because the polarity or the agenda, if you will, is progress or advancement. As leaders, we, we, we should be coming at things with no agenda. So we, 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 we don't, we should be open to outcome. But there is an outcome that we are trying to achieve and that is progress or advancement. So there is a, a kind of global or universal agenda or it seems to me that there is and I think it's a good one. I don't think it's a bad one to have. I just th think that there is one there, but the route to get there, what I hear is we, we should remain open to um, the collective developing that, to, to co-constructing the, the, the pathway to that larger outcome. Yes, I think you've articulated it very well. So it, it, it kind of relates somewhat to the question that Alexandre raised about better, right? What does better look like? Um, so, so the place I start from when I think of progress is a statement by Abdul Baha in which he says that in this world, we're all either progressing or retrogressing. There's no such thing as remaining static. So when I, you think of progress in those very large terms, it starts to offer a very broad scope of where you could go. In other words, even the goals that you can set, there can be a thousand different goals, all of whom, which take you in the direction of progress as opposed to backwards. Um, I, let, let, let me get really concrete about it so, so, that, uh, so, it, so it makes sense. So I do a lot of work in global governance, as, as you probably know. So one of the conversations I've been having with my peers is about, we had a, a podcast on the, like the best path to the, a world federation and each person has their own view of the path we should take okay so the progress is creating wider circles of integration right that's the progress you could do this in a hundred ways one person suggests that the next step is to create a un parliamentary assembly that is elected by people, but it's an advisory body to the General Assembly, which itself is an advisory body. Another person says, well, that's crazy. Um, we should just have a direct election for a new parliament at a global level that has the power to legislate and bind. Another person says we should take NATO and expand it and make it into a collective decision-making body. So these are all different paths. 
But the ultimate aim, the progress writ large is advancing towards more integration in unity. So unity is a very broad concept. So again, I think we need to be careful not to get too wrapped around the axle about what constitutes progress. I think it's actually a lot easier to recognize it and see it and to recognize when something is not progress. So um, authoritarian regimes and nationalism is not progress because you're unwinding all of that progress towards integration that's being made. A, a, a nation pulling out of the European Union, a Brexit um, in terms of deeper integration is not progress, it's the opposite. So they say things are a lot simpler than we make them out to be. And, and the same is true in the Baha'i community. There are many routes to progress. And that's why I think when I talk to fellow Baha'is, I encourage them to be far more creative and innovative than we are being. We tend to fall into, form, we tend to fall into formulaic action. You know, we have devotionals, all the devotionals start to look the same, sound the same. It's like, oh, really? You know, uh, ways to study the, the, the word of God. We, we just need to be so much more imaginative and creative. But we get very myopic because we start to, to box ourselves in by, well, what is progress and what path should I be on? And it, we need to let go of all of that. And it's end. So another principle that, that we use a lot in coaching is there are no mistakes. Now that's an interesting one, but it actually maps really well to something that we as Baha'is do, which is don't worry about making mistakes. There was a statement from the Universal House of Justice is that, that told us years ago that we should feel free to experiment and have the culture of learning because even if we make mistakes, we are stronger than we think we are and we're not going to you know, they're not going to be devastating. So try things and we'll soon figure out if we're going upwards or downwards, progressing or retrogressing. No, I, I, I agree with the, the whole overall thrust here. I, I was comment, two comments. One, the, the comment to Alex that I, uh, I have worked in cultures where making uh, good suggestions was uh, a, a path to getting fired. Um, there are very acid cultures that are not interested in hearing um, you to have an idea different than the boss. Uh, and and uh, probably the best suggestion is to get out of them as opposed to what do in them. But, uh, but, but I, I have definitely seen such things. Yeah, I'm, I was just mostly just curious as to what, uh, to what extent we're preaching to the choir here. Uh, we all agree with these points and the questions are more, uh, are not whether the points are valid, but how to implement them and what the implementation issues are. Start your own businesses. That's one really good way of implementing some role modeling, role modeling for others, uh, how it can be done, that it can be done, and that you can make a success of yourself having done it. Um, I also have to tell you that it may sound like we're preaching to the choir, but one of the things I was able to do, have the luxury of doing during the pandemic, is participating in a bunch of um, coaching challenges conducted by right, really famous world coaches like Tony Robbins, right, Anthony Robbins. His ideas are very closely aligned with our ideas. And when I saw the number of people from around the world participating, so um, one of the challenges that he did, there were 434,000 people participating on the various platforms, including Facebook. People, and we, we went for seven days, 13 hours a day. People were so interested in these ideas, they didn't wanna take a bathroom break. And they were doing it in the confines of their home with their screaming kids and their dogs and people in Australia who were staying up all night in order to participate. There is a thirst out there. So while this particular group may be preaching to the choir, there is a thirst out there because people have come to recognize in large part, thanks to COVID and what everything we're experiencing, the suffering we're going through that our systems don't work anymore. They just don't work. They're falling under their own weight. And so we need to be able to say, well, here's the alternative. And yes, there are toxic environments. I worked in one of those when I was at the State Department again. Um, 
our bosses viewed it as a threat to them if we came up with a good idea because the way they read it was, oh, you're making me look bad because I as the boss wasn't the one to come up with the idea. So you're actually undermining me by sharing a good idea. So yes, those kinds of environments exist. And you're right, at some point you gotta decide, is this the place for me or not? I, I hightailed it out of there <laughs> because it wasn't the place for me. However, having said that, it's not enough to say leave toxic environments. We need to actually be proactively creating new environments and demonstrating to others. And, and I loved also what you asked uh, as one of the points that you made is demand from leaders. So not only demand from ourselves uh, as leaders in whatever role we play within the organization, but also be more demanding of the leaders and leaders. And I think with the intention of making things, as Alex would say, better. So it's not I want because I am, this is what I want, but I demand this from you because everybody will benefit from that. So that, can you just mention something as we are in the closing, something about this demanding from our leaders, from people in our organizations to be better. So, so this idea actually came up in the context of, of global governance, where we were talking about elections and, and us getting smarter about electing fit and worthy leaders, right? Um, when, when we get to the point where we're no longer willing to put up with unfit leaders, then we demand certain ones, but then we take on, we own the responsibility of, 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 of electing those leaders and then holding their feet higher. In business, it's a little different because if you step into an existing business, it's not like you can uh, replace the leadership, right? But then there are probably ways in which you can, in a spirit again of humility and spirit of wanting to better the business, maybe start having conversations with the leadership, asking to go in and meet with the leadership and saying, you know, because again, you're not making them look bad by raising it in the context of other people and, 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 and shaming them in some sense, if you're worried about that, but to ask to meet privately and say, you know, I had a couple of ideas. I wanted to float by you. I, you know, um, it's, 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 it's I, I just have the, the, the good of the company at heart and let me know how I can help if this is of interest to you. Fantastic. So we just run through it. We are at the end of the hour. Uh, do you have a, a closing word perhaps for us? I shared the link to your book, which I think we're very keen to read uh, through right now to get more insights and so forth. We want to hear more of you. Maybe a, just a few last words just to close uh, this, this dialogue together. I think the key, the place to start is shifting bringing to consciousness really our old beliefs. And I think just even in our session today, we were able to see how sometimes the tapes that we have, very often we've learned to think a certain way from childhood, from the way our parents taught us, from rules that our society or the media or our culture taught us. Um, and we get trapped in them and they drive us and they actually impede our progress. Uh, they're like weeds in a garden. As we're trying to create better organizations and businesses, these old mindsets are like weeds that strangle the growth before it's even taken off. So let's think about it as that. We're going to start by weeding the garden, removing old mindsets and old habits, and then planting our beautiful seeds and flowers. Those are the new mindsets and new habits. How's that for a wrap?